This is a psalm of David. It is the word of God. Ascribe to the Lord, O heavenly beings. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The God of glory thunders the Lord over many waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. The Lord breaks the cedars of Lebanon. He makes Lebanon to skip like a calf and Syrian like a young wild ox. The voice of the Lord flashes forth flames of fire. The voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness. The Lord shakes the wilderness of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord makes the deer give birth and strips the forest bare. And in his temple all cry, Glory! The Lord sits enthroned over the flood. The Lord sits enthroned as king forever. May the Lord give strength to his people. May the Lord bless his people with peace. Let's pray once more. Heavenly Father, we, we are gathered here to worship you. God, as we know that even our brothers in Ukraine this morning have, have gathered to worship you. Because you are worthy. You are king. You are over everything. You are sovereign. You are almighty. And you are good. So Lord, I just ask that you would receive our praise this morning. As our God. And Lord, as we've given offerings this morning, Lord, I ask that you would take those offerings and use those to, to further your glory in this world. That, that more and more people would hear the good news of Christ, that those who are hurting would be helped. And Lord, I pray that you'd be with us also this morning as we spend time in your word. Make its meaning clear and write it on our hearts that we might glorify you in our lives. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please remain standing as we sing.
This song we're going to split so men please follow me ladies follow the ladies
Father, we thank you for the opportunity, dear Lord, to be here. We thank you that we are, we live in a free country, dear Lord, that we may lift your name up in praises, dear Lord, with no fear of condemnation. We pray that you will just guide and direct each and every one of us, dear Lord. Prepare our hearts right now. Open them up so we may hear your word preached, dear Lord, that we may apply it to our lives and live in each and every day. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Go ahead and open your Bible to Daniel 9. Um, as soon as the, the news of Russian troops massing on the border of Ukraine hit the news, there was a spike in end time speculation. The fact is that end times excitement and speculation seem to ebb and flow over the history of the church. And when it peaks, the books flow like water. Uh, and the titles are often good ones. I, I looked at my own bookshelf. There's The Meaning of the Millennium, Visions of Heaven and Hell, Apocalypse Not, The Apocalypse Code, The Bible in the Future, The Blessed Hope, The Second Coming, Antichrist, Creation and the Second Coming, Last Days According to Jesus, and The Life Beyond. And that was just the ones I saw on my bookshelf. Uh, the, the best title award go has to go to the first end times book I ever read. Best title, not best book. Uh, the Late Great Planet Earth by Hal Lindsey. Um, I was a teenager and mom and dad had those end tables that had room for a few books and it was there and that title just got me so I read it and I don't think mom and dad knew I was reading it or they might have talked to me. Um, it, it, so if books aren't your thing though, right, there are movies. And those go in waves. In the, in the 70s, I was scared to death by the series A Thief in the Night. Um, and then there were Jack Van Impey films that he did. And then, of course, the biggie a few years back was the Left Behind series. There are a lot of books and a lot of movies filled with a lot of speculation about the end times. But there's only one book you can trust for the truth about what God has planned for this world and his people. That's the Bible. And it is not nearly as concerned that you and I figure out the narrative plot of the end times and how that fits today's news as many people would have you might think. Indeed, here in the most popular Old Testament end times prophecy book, Daniel, the main message is this. There is a way that the people of God need to live in a fallen land. There is a way for the people of God to live in a fallen land. Remember what we've already seen. In the first six chapters of Daniel, God is a God of both judgment and grace, who is sovereign over his people, the fallen world, and every king in every kingdom. In chapter 7, we saw that our sovereign God will have victory over the kingdoms of men. 
And in chapter 8, we saw that the sovereignty of God is actually the saint's true source of comfort in this life and in the next. Now, as we get to chapter 9, which is the go-to end times chapter for a lot of people in the book of Daniel, I think what we're going to see is that God has a way he wants us to respond to prophecies about the end. That God has a way he wants us to respond to prophecies about the end. I'm going to ask that you stand in honor of God's word if you're able. These are long chapters. I'm going to be reading Daniel chapter 9. And this is the word of God. In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, by descent Amid, who was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, perceived in the books the number of the years that according to the word of the Lord to Jeremiah the prophet must pass before the end of the desolations of Jerusalem, namely, 70 years. Then I turned my face to the Lord God, seeking him by prayer and pleas for mercy, with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. I prayed to the Lord my God and made confession, saying, O Lord, the great and awesome God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments, we have sinned and done wrong and acted wickedly and rebelled, turning aside from your commandments and rules. We have not listened to your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your na name to our kings, our princes, and our fathers, and to all the people of the land. To you, O Lord, belongs righteousness, but to us open shame, as at this day to the men of Judah, to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and to all Israel, those who are near and those who are far away, in all the lands to which you have driven them because of the treachery that they have committed against you. To us, O Lord, belongs open shame. To our kings, to our princes, and to our fathers, because we have sinned against you. To the Lord our God belong mercy and forgiveness, for we have rebelled against him and have not obeyed the voice of the Lord our God by walking in his laws, which he set before us by his servants, the prophets. All Israel has transgressed your law and turned aside, refusing to obey your voice. And the curse and the oath that are written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, have been poured out upon us because we have sinned against him. He has confirmed his words, which he spoke against us and against our rulers who ruled us by bringing upon us a great calamity. For under the whole heaven there has not been done anything like what has been done against Jerusalem. As it is written in the law of Moses, all this calamity has come upon us Yet we have not entreated the favor of the Lord our God, turning from our iniquities and gaining insight by your truth. Therefore the Lord has kept ready the calamity and has brought it upon us. For the Lord our God is righteous in all the works that he has done, and we have not obeyed his voice. Now, O Lord our God, who brought your people out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand and have made a name for yourself as at this day, we have sinned. We have done wickedly. O Lord, according to all your righteous acts, let your anger and your wrath turn away from your city, Jerusalem, your holy hill. Because of our sins and for the iniquities of our fathers, Jerusalem and your people have become a byword among all who are around us. Now, therefore, O our God, listen to the prayer of your servant and to his pleas for mercy. And for your own sake, O Lord, make your face to shine upon your sanctuary, which is desolate. O my God, incline your ear and hear. Open your eyes and see our desolations in the city that is called by your name. For we do not present our pleas before you because of our righteousness, but because of your great mercy. O Lord, hear, O Lord, forgive. O Lord, pay attention and act. Delay not for your own sake, O oh my God, because your city and your people are called by your name. While I was speaking and praying, confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel, and presenting my plea before the Lord my God for the holy hill of my God, while I was speaking in prayer, the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at first, 
came to me in swift flight at the time of the evening sacrifice. He made me understand and speaking with me and saying, O oh, Daniel, I have now come to give you insight and understanding. At the beginning of your pleas for mercy, a word went out, and I have come to tell to you, for you are greatly loved. Therefore, consider the word and understand the vision. Seventy weeks are decreed about your people and your holy city to finish the transgression, to put an end to sin and to atone for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal both vision and profit, and to anoint a most holy place. Know, therefore, and understand that from the going out of the word to restore and build Jerusalem to the coming of an anointed one, a prince, there shall be seven weeks. Then for 62 weeks it shall be built again with squares and a moat, but in a troubled time. And after the 62 weeks, an anointed one shall be cut off and shall have nothing. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Its end shall come with a flood, and to the end there shall be war. Desolations are decreed, and he shall make strong covenant with many for one week. And for half of the week he shall put an end to sacrifice and offering. And on the wing of abomination shall come one who makes desolate until the decreed end is poured out on the desolator. Father, this is your word and we need your word. Your spirit inspired us this word and we ask that your spirit would illuminate it to us. Make it clear to our minds and write it on our hearts that we might glorify you. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated. So, Daniel 9 reveals to us, as I said, how to respond to prophecies about the end. How to respond to prophecies about the end. First, we're shown the example of Daniel, right? Daniel responds to prophecies about the end, which he's been receiving for eight chapters now, right? He's been receiving these prophecies, and he responds to them first by believing God's word. By believing God's word. Chapter 9 starts. It's, it's the start of the reign of Darius the Mede after Babylon's been conquered. And Daniel says... I perceived in the books the number of years that according to the word of the Lord to Jeremiah the prophet must pass before the end of desolations of Jerusalem, namely 70 years. Kingdom of Babylon has fallen to the Medes. The head of gold in chapter 2 has become the chest of arms and silver. The, the lion with eagle's wings in chapter 7 has become the bear with ribs in its teeth from chapter 7, and it's been about 70 years that Daniel's been in captivity and his captors have been defeated. Daniel looked at that and Daniel knew what Jeremiah had said and Daniel believed what Jeremiah had said. In Jeremiah 25, 11, Jeremiah was, was, had just proclaimed that God was going to send Judah off into exile for the sins to be taken away by Nebuchadnezzar. And Jeremiah said, This whole land shall become a ruin and a waste, and these nations shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years. After the 70 years are completed, God says, I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation, the land of the Chaldeans, for their iniquity, making the land an everlasting waste. Jeremiah said that Judah would be in captivity for 70 years, and at the end of 70 years, Babylon would be defeated. So Daniel knows we've been in captivity about 70 years, and Babylon's just been defeated, because Darius is now king, and Daniel believes the word of God, so Daniel says something must be about to happen. Something's going to... Is it time to go home? Is what Daniel's asking. But I, I, I want us to focus in on this, though. Daniel only asks that question because Daniel believes the word of God. Period. Now, we don't have prophecies exactly like the one in Jeremiah. We don't have a lot to hang our chronological hat on. 
As to the return of Christ, Jesus Himself said, right? Concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven nor the Son. So, so we don't know days and hours. No matter what the guy on TV, the preacher on TV tells you, we don't know the day and the hour. We can't tie our prophecies to our calendars. But we have something. We have something. We're told that Jesus is coming. And we're told how to live while we wait for Him to come. In 2 Peter 3.14, Peter writes, Therefore, beloved, since you are waiting for these, be diligent to be found by Him without spot or blemish and at peace. And count the patience of our Lord as salvation. The things of this world are going to perish. So Peter says, but he says, as you wait for that to happen, be found without spot or blemish in the Lord. How do we handle the prophecies of the end found in the Bible? We believe the Bible. We believe the Bible. This is our go-to book. And what it says we believe and we trust, including what it says will happen, but also what it says we must be in light of the fact that it's going to happen. So the first thing we do, we respond to the end by believing God's word. So, so how do you? How are you handling the prophecies in the Bible? Do you believe them as they're written in Scripture? Which ain't exactly how it is in the books and the movies where they fill in the blanks, right? If they're blanks in Scripture, my advice is let them be blanks. But believe the words that are there. Do you? Do you live a life devoted to Christ because the end is coming? Instead of devoted to the world that will disappear? Or are you devoted to Christ? Do you give thanks to God? That he has been patient long enough that you can believe and be saved. Do you give thanks to him for that? Do you handle the prophecies in the Bible by believing the Bible and following the word of God? Well, Daniel responds to the prophecies of the end by believing God's word. And Daniel responds to the prophecies of the end by repenting for his sins and for the sins of his people. He responds to the prophecies by repenting of his sins and the sins of his people. Now, in verse 3, we read that Daniel prayed, but we need to pay close attention to what Daniel prayed. He says in, in verse 4, O Lord, the great and awesome God, who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments, we have sinned. We have done wrong. We have acted wickedly. We have rebelled. We have turned aside from your commandments. Daniel first acknowledges the greatness and the grace of God. And then he says, God, that's who you are, but who we are is pretty bad. We are wicked, rebellious, sinful people. We have sinned. Now, Daniel's not saying Israel, they have sinned. But I'm okay. He's saying we have sinned. He doesn't settle for any generic discussion of sin either, does he? Daniel just doesn't say, well, we have sinned. God forgive us. Make it all right again. Starting in verse 6, he says, we didn't listen to the prophets. When they spoke your name to the kings, the princes, our fathers, and all the people. Everybody heard them, and we didn't listen, Lord. You are righteous, but we deserve shame. We should be ashamed of ourselves as the people of Judah, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and those who are Israel, and those who are near, those are all the people who heard your prophets and didn't listen. God, we should be ashamed. We own the shame. We have acted in covenant treason against you. You made this wonderful promise of blessing and said, just live as my people and I'll bless you. And we just acted in rebellion. And then verse 8, God, we own open shame. Our kings, our princes, our fathers, because we've sinned against you. God, they did it. And it, it, and it, and it, it carries to us 
We own the shame because of our father's sin. We don't like to hear that, right? But then verse 9, he goes on. He says, God, you're merciful and forgiving. And that's good because we are just rebels. We rebelled against you. We didn't obey the voice of God by following his laws that he laid out by his prophets. God, they made it pretty clear how we could serve you and how we could glorify you, but we continued to rebel against you. It's a good thing you're merciful and forgiving or we would be destroyed already. In verse 11, all of Israel's done this. God, we all own this. We were your covenant people, and when your covenant people break covenant, we own it, he says. He says, I can't just say there's good Israel, bad Israel, and the bad Israel guys are in trouble, I'm sure, God. Good Israel guys, they're okay. He says, no, we are your covenant people. We own it. We are guilty as a people because God's covenant was with a people. In verse 12, God confirmed his words that he spoke against us and our rulers. He says, under the whole heaven, there's never been anything done like what was done in Jerusalem. He's saying, God, never has it been that you made covenant with the people and promised them such great blessings, but then had to bring them such great curses as your people. Because in verse 13, it was written in the law of Moses that that would happen. Blessing and curse, right? Stand on one mountain, blessing, one mountain, curse. And they chose the curses is what Daniel's saying. We, we chose to sin. We chose to be cursed. So in verse 14, he says, it only makes sense that the Lord has kept ready the calamity and brought it upon us. For the Lord our God is righteous in the works that he has done, and we have not obeyed him. Our God is perfectly righteous, Daniel says. So when we don't obey him, the only thing we can be is unrighteous. And so God took that calamity he promised, and he brought it out upon us. We were gifted, blessed in the promised land. God gave us everything we needed, but we rebelled, and he brought the curse upon us. Daniel never refers to Israel as they. You saw that, right? Never. It's we, us. Daniel is in covenant with God, but he is in covenant with God as part of God's people. So Daniel acknowledges that when God's people sin, I own that. Corporate sin is what Daniel acknowledges. He confesses the sins of his people as his own. Daniel responds to the prophecies of the end by repenting of sin, his and his people's. We are suffering because of our sin. Daniel was willing to confess that. Willing to say, God, we are suffering because of our sin. And he repented. Now that makes us terribly uncomfortable, doesn't it? makes me uncomfortable. I hope I'm not the only one in the room. I mean, should we really confess and repent for us? The church? Brothers and sisters, if you love the book of Daniel that contains this prayer, you ought to love the book of Revelation. And the book of Revelation opens with letters written to churches in Daniel, Daniel confesses as a member of Israel and says, our sin. In Revelation, God, through John, writes to, these are the words of Christ, to the church in Ephesus. I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Now, do you think... There's any way to read that and say the seven of you in the church of Ephesus who have forgotten need to repent or else. It is a letter to the church because when the church has people in it who are sinning and the church does nothing about it, the church is sinning with them. We own our sin. He says to the church in Pergamum, 
You have some there who hold the teaching of Balaam. Also, you have some who hold the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Therefore, repent, because you have them in your midst. He's not just saying they need to repent. You need to repent because you have them. There's something we really need to take at heart. Now, boy, I, I mean, this hit me. It is so easy to talk about the evangelical church in America and the problems with it. It's so easy to speak ill of the problems in our church, speaking of them. Brothers and sisters, I think Daniel makes it very clear. We need to say we and us more often. If there is sin in the body of Christ, it is our sin. And until we repent, we are arrogant to believe that God would pour out his blessings. And as you think about that, I think we have to think about this. The Great Commission was given to the church as a command to be obeyed. It says, go. It doesn't say, I'm commissioning you, and on your commission, it'll... No, it says, go. Make disciples. Have we made disciples? Or do we need to repent? The command to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength is the great commandment. Have we loved the Lord our God with all our beings, or have we loved the world, and do we need to repent? Do we need to repent? The command to love our neighbor as ourselves is a command. Have we loved our neighbor as much as we've loved ourselves? Would it be reflected in the way we live? There are precious promises to followers of Christ in the Word of God. There are warnings too. Friends, I think it's time we admit that we have sinned and that we turn from that sin, confess that sin to God together and turn from it. Daniel responds to prophecies of the end by believing the word of God and by repenting for his and his people's sin. And Daniel responds to prophecies of the end by resting on God's righteous mercy. Praise God for this part after that part, right? I mean, isn't it true? If we own our sin, aren't you glad that we have the example of Daniel resting on the mercy of God? That's what he does. They have suffered for 70 years in captivity. And, and it's been bad. Daniel says it's so bad that even though we were suffering, we didn't turn to God and repent. He said, it's that bad. But then he says, God... Show us mercy. Daniel's not going to go to God and say, God, we've put in our 70 years. Surely we've earned our freedom and return home now. That's not how it works. He, he just says, God, we need your mercy. I mean, look at verses 16 to 19. First in verse 16, Lord, according to your righteous acts, let your anger and your wrath turn away from your city. According to your righteous acts, we are full of iniquities. According to your righteousness, do it, God. Verse 17. O oh God, listen to the prayer of your servant and to his pleas for mercy and for your own sake. O oh Lord, make your face shine on your sanctuary. God, do it because you deserve glory and because you show kindness to people who deserve wrath. Mercy. Verse 18. God, incline your ear and hear, open your eyes, see our desolations in the city that is called by your name. For we do not present our pleas before you because of our righteousness, but because of your great mercy. God, so that your name will be glorified, show mercy to your people so that the world can look and say, what a merciful God Yahweh is. In verse 19, O Lord, Hear, Lord, forgive. Oh, Lord, pay attention and act. Delay not for your own sake. Oh, my God, because your city and your people are called by your name. Again, God, do it for your glory. Show mercy to them. 
for your glory. Show mercy to us for your glory. Don't count us guilty anymore. Turn away your curses and your wrath, God, and do it because you are righteous. Not because we are, because we aren't. So just base it on your righteousness. Let it be mercy. Do good to those who deserve evil. And God, do it for your own glory. Don't do it to make much of us. We have sinned. Don't make much of us, Lord, but make much of yourself in your name. You know what Daniel's begging for is amazing grace. It's God, show us your mercy and your grace. And that's how Daniel responds to these prophecies of the end times. He repents and he begs God for mercy and grace. Doesn't that flow right? You start with your own sin and you beg for mercy. And isn't it good that you don't have to rely on your own righteousness? I mean, how many of us this morning are willing to go to God and say, God, I've been good enough. Bless me. If you are, let's talk. Because I can find somebody who can explain why you're not. Right? Well, as a church, can we say as a church, God, we've been good enough. Bless us. Can we say that? I tell you what, I'd much rather lean on the everlasting arms, stand on the solid rock, trust the righteousness of Christ, and beg Him for mercy. Because therein lies hope. That's where our hope lies, in the merciful kindness of God based on His righteousness. Isn't it good that we don't even have to say, God, I think my repentance has been pretty impressive. I've shed enough tears. I've really regretted my sin enough, God. So I think this time you ought to go ahead and just bless me. I mean, I'm not going with that one either. Because I know my heart. Isn't it wonderful that we can just lean on His righteousness and His mercy? And shouldn't that be what we do when we consider the prophecies of the end? Look at that end and say, God, that, that all this will be destroyed and that you will bring judgment and know that I deserve that. But so, God, I'm just going to lean on your mercy. As your people, God, we will lean on your mercy. So this morning, let me just encourage you. If you've tried to be good enough for God and say, said, God, bless me because I'm good enough. Or if you've tried to be guilty enough for God, you know what I mean, sorry enough for God, just quit it. You're going to fail in both instances. Just lean on Jesus and, and, and run to him for his mercy and trust in his righteousness. So Daniel responds to the prophecies of the end by believing God's word, repenting for his and his people's sins, and resting in God's righteous mercy. What does God do when Daniel does that? What does God do? God rewards Daniel with the promise of the gospel. He rewards him with the promise of the gospel. Gabriel shows up and Gabriel's got an answer. He says, Daniel, we heard you. Your prayers were heard. And Gabriel comes and he says, Daniel... God is going to give you understanding about how he is going to answer your prayer. So Daniel is saying, look, 70 years are over. Babylon's destroyed. God, is it time? Do we get to go home and be your people in the promised land again? That's what he's asking. And Gabriel comes with an answer, and it's about 70 weeks of years, 77s. And how do we interpret Gabriel's words about 70 years? Well, let's just say it isn't easy. It's not easy. Many Christian interpreters disagree, but that's not going to stop us from looking at it this morning. So let's look at it. Verse, verse 24, 70 weeks are decreed about your people and your holy city to finish transgression, to put an end to sin, and to atone for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal both vision and prophet and anoint a most holy place. So 490 years, and in the end, all this good, awesome stuff is going to happen, right? 77s, 
and God will at the tenfold jubilee, by the way, right? That's ten jubilee years, 490 years, leaves you ten jubilee years when everything is set right. At the end of that one, God is going to make it all right. Atone for sin. He's going to finish. Sin's going to end. And, and everlasting righteousness is going to come in. And all the vision and prophecy is going to come to its end, right? It's the promise. That's what he says. Now, how does that work? Well, Gabriel explains that too. In verse 25, from the going out of the word to restore and rebuild Jerusalem to the coming of an anointed one, a prince, there shall be seven weeks. Then for 62 weeks, it shall be built again with squares and a moat, but in a troubled time. So for the first 69 weeks of years, God is going to be about the the business of preparing the city of God for an anointed one, a Messiah who will come. Now, we're not going to get bogged down on what all fits into those 483 years because we're running a little late already this morning. And I don't have it in my notes anyway. We're not going to get bogged down in that, but, but we're going to look at what he says. What he says, for 483 years, God is going to be restoring Jerusalem for the coming of a Messiah. And it's going to be during a troubled time. Now, I don't know about you, that sounds to me like the Old Testament. They get to come back, God restores the nation, but he's only doing so to prepare it for the coming of a Messiah. And then the Messiah comes. The Messiah comes. But, first part of verse 26, after the 62 weeks, which were after the seven, so after 69 weeks, an anointed one shall be cut off and shall have nothing. The Messiah will be cut off and have nothing. I believe that's pretty simple. Christ is crucified. The sinless Son of God comes to his people. He is cut off. He is taken outside the gates and crucified as one not welcome in the presence of the people of God. Then the passage gets incredibly complicated. Okay, that, that part was the, actually the easy part. Second part of verse 26. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Its end shall come with the flood, and in there shall be war. Desolations are decreed, and he shall make a strong covenant with many for one week, and for half of the week he shall put an end to sacrifice and offering. And on the wing of abomination shall come one who makes desolate until the decreed end is poured out on the desolator. So after the 69th week, before the details of the 70th week, the Messiah comes and Christ is crucified. And that has to happen right then. And then all of this stuff he describes here is in the 70th week. Well, there is no way we can look at history and package all of that within seven years of the crucifixion. You just can't do it. I mean, I wish I could because that would fit my outline a lot better. Right? Right? So we don't have events that happen within seven years of the cross that fit these verses. So people come up with theories. And, and I'll share a couple. Some folks look at verses 26 and 27 and say, well, what happens, he's talking about is the events of A.D. 70. When the Roman general Titus came into Jerusalem and burned the temple to the ground. Kind of like we talked about old Antiochus Epiphanes back in the Old Testament. Now, Titus comes in, and he burns the temple to the ground. Others look at verse 26, 27, and say, no, nope, no, nope. this must be moving all the way to the end of times and talking about the Antichrist. Well, because of something called typology, I believe we should read both. We, we know that he's not being absolutely literal about the years at this point. Um, Nobody reads it absolutely literal. Some people say it's literal, but we put a gap between 69 and 70. That's not literal. And other people say the 70th week starts with the crucifixion and doesn't end until Christ comes. Well, that's not literal either. Right? So it's not literal. 
I, I don't know of anybody who makes it literal. Um, but I, I do say it's, it's not hard to see 70 AD here. It's not hard. Um, Israel started to revolt against the Roman occupiers in 66 AD. And it got bad enough that the Romans sent in an army under Titus in 69 AD and laid siege to Jerusalem. And it was horrible. There was starvation. I mean, it, it was terrible. And in the end, 70 AD, Titus marches into Jerusalem, kills people. The, I mean, the streets run with blood and he burns the temple to the ground. So, Daniel's being told, Messiah will come, he will die, he will accomplish atonement for sins and dying, we know that. So he will die, and then there'll be this time when one will come and destroy Jews. So 70 AD works, but it's not complete, it doesn't feel like, does it? It seems like, yeah, but there's more. And that's where that thing called typology comes in. A type is is something that is in the Old Testament that is bigger and happens again in the New Testament and they're tied together by the same meaning. So Titus comes and he's a type, but there's an antichrist who will come and be an antitype. He will behave this same way toward the people of God at the end. <clears throat> Remember, what's being asked? Daniel's saying, Jeremiah said 70 years... And the desolation's over. So does that mean we get to go home and be Israel, your kingdom, living as your people in the land? And Gabriel comes, Daniel, I'm going to give you some understanding. It's more complicated than that. Because remember, what Gabriel's explaining is how we get to the point where sin is over, sin has been atoned for, and righteousness reigns forever. That's the ant that's Gabriel's taking the story all the way out to there. He's saying, Daniel, just getting you to move back to Jerusalem's not the thing. The thing is getting to the point where sin is taken care of. And here's how that's going to happen. It's going to you're going to get back in the land. You're going to get back in the land, but but then the Messiah will come and he will die. And that's necessary for us to get to that sins atoned for thing. He said, and then there's going to be this period and there's going to be, be suffering by the people of God. By old covenant Israel, they will suffer. I believe in 70 AD when the temple is burned, that's actually just the old covenant done. I mean, that's the end. They have no temple. They've got no place to go offer sacrifices. Done. So, so that's the end of that. But that's not the end of the people of God because he has a church. He has a new people of God. But guess what? They're going to suffer in the end. But good news. The desolator has a decreed destruction. Whether it's Titus or the Antichrist coming to do evil, there will be an end to it. And in that end, the little stone will crush the brass feet of the statue. And the kingdom of God will reign forever and ever in righteousness. Sin will be no more. So that's the promise. And so how you fill in all the blanks on the 70 weeks, if you've got a chart you want to show me, I'll look at it. I can't promise I'll love it. But I, I think the big thing we've got to get is that what Gabriel came and brought to Daniel, he says, Daniel... I'm going to give you understanding. And he's not saying, Daniel, I'm going to give you understanding of your timeline. He's saying, Daniel, I'm going to give you an understanding of the gospel. There's going to be a Messiah who will come and die and sins will be atoned for. And there will be a forever kingdom of righteousness where sin will be no more. And he got the years right all the way up to Christ being dead. I mean, that, that one works, however you want to make that fit. And that 70th week is, is obviously something different going on there. But in the end, because Christ died for sins, there will be a kingdom of righteousness that will last forever, Daniel. He brought him the good news. He brought him the gospel. So as we look at Daniel and we look at prophecies of the end, how do we deal with them? We deal with them by believing God's word, by repenting of our sins, 
by resting on God's righteous mercy and by embracing the gospel. That's how we deal with prophecy. It turns out Daniel is not a weird book sitting in the middle of your Old Testament, but it fits. It fits a book that is about Jesus and the good news of a Messiah who atones for sins and offers an eternal kingdom of righteousness to all who will believe. So this morning, I would just ask you, where do you find your hope? As we look at these prophecies of the end, I, I, I tell you, I've, I've encountered way too many people who get caught up in trying to figure out the details, so caught up that they lose their hope. They're scared. They're constantly chasing the Antichrist in the newspaper. I mean, I don't know how many Antichrists I've seen be declared since I've been you know, first looking at newspapers. And I'm not that old. Right? So they're constantly looking for the Antichrist. They're constantly looking for the horror that's going to come. Well, that's not the message of, of, of these prophecies about the end. Yeah, it's coming on the unrighteousness and the wicked, but people of God, take hope. Jesus died for your sin. You are forgiven. Your sins are taken care of. And one day Christ will come again and there will be a kingdom of righteousness where sin will be no more. And you are part of that. So take hope. And as you think of those who don't have that hope, don't just put numbers on their forehead and consign them to an eternal hell, but get out there and tell them about Jesus. Call them to repentance and faith and offer them hope and eternal life as well. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the good news that Gabriel brought to Daniel. And we thank you that we have the rest of the story. God, thank you for the promise of eternal life that is ours in Jesus Christ. And God, I pray for anyone here this morning who has never placed their faith in Christ. I pray that as they consider that, that there is an eternity coming and that only the people of God will live in that kingdom of righteousness God, I pray that you would help them see their sin and that they would turn to Christ and be saved. And Lord, I pray for us as your people. God, may we not fear sufferings that may come on the way to eternity, but may we live in hope and in joy because of Christ. And may we spread that hope and that joy with all our abilities. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, Brother Tom's going to come lead us in a closing hymn, and as he does, I would ask that you respond to God's word, that you deal with sin in your life, that you repent where that's needed, that you give up the pursuit of of righteousness to please God or give up trying to be sad enough about your sins to please God but lean on his mercy and, and that maybe that for the first time ever today you place your faith in Jesus Christ and believe and be saved and if you do that I'd ask that as, you, as we sing you come forward or, or if you want to say hey I want to show the world that I believe that through baptism let's talk about that come forward and let's talk about that but whatever you do, please deal with God's word this morning. Please stand.